Well, good morning, Anchor Point Church. What a change of events that is going on. News all over the city, the country, the world, different things that are going on. Today, I will not focus a ton of my attention on coronavirus. Uh, we don't know how long uh, we're going to do church in our living room, but however long we need to, uh, we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to see what that looks like. We'll keep you up to date kind of week by week, but this week for sure, next week I'm certain uh, we'll probably have a few weeks like this and, and we'll just try to keep you posted with updates all along. So a couple things I just wanted to let you know about. First off, um, if you're gathered by yourself or you have a few other people that are with you, I think it's really good. I know that the, the coronavirus, we're taking precautionary measures, but if someone isn't coughing or sick or doesn't have symptoms and they haven't traveled, I think we just need to be together. Paul tells us that we should... Uh, not neglect getting together to worship and to break bread and to and to do that. And so I think that's a really, really important thing that we continue to do. Again, if there's nerves about doing it, don't. Uh, maybe if there's someone that's a little bit sick or something going on, it's no problem. What you can do is you can FaceTime someone in, you can put a speaker on, you can have a way in which people can still interact together. If you are sick, uh, and you need prayer, like you can ask for prayer and they can even, again, FaceTime or something. We have technology that we can care one for another. And so if you need to do that, that is great. Um, again, just a, a reminder, a little bit about, about the coronavirus. It's, it's a virus, it's not a bacteria. So like antibiotics doesn't take care of it, but it needs a, a live cell in order for it to grow. So if you are like spitting all over the place, that's, that's not good. That's why sneezing is, is not helpful for this. But it needs to be live. It needs to like get onto your skin or into your mouth or whatever that would end up being. So just reminder, they're recommending things like if you drink a little bit of water every like 15-ish minutes, then what it does is it washes inside and when it gets to your stomach, the acid burns it away and it is no more. So that is just some of the stuff that you can be doing. I think it's really interesting that we get to gather in our homes. So maybe today... If you're, if you're meeting with us today because it was so last minute, it's like this, you're not meeting with people. But perhaps this is something that's going to be really important. Gather. You can, we're recording this ahead of time. So you can have breakfast or brunch together with all of your cells, some of your cell. That would be awesome. Meet. You can listen to this together. We, we've put together a playlist, a worship playlist for you. You can go on to uh, the, the app. Or on the website, but if you go on the app and you go under church at the bottom uh, bottom corner, then you have a spot that says worship set. And it says in there you have Apple Music Playlist or a Spotify playlist. And it tells you the songs that are in there. And if you would like time to just go and worship God uh, through it, I think that would be a really, really great thing. So make use of it. Uh, worship God. How often do we actually take our families, pray together, worship together, meet Him together? Uh, we often rely on the church to pull it, pull it off. We have a worship team and a speaker. That's awesome. But how often do we actually like stop and do we do that? Do we pray with our families and do we come in that way and take a significant amount of time to do that? So if there hasn't been a reason to pray in the past, there is now. And uh, Scott, who's behind the camera, thank you, Scott. Um, we were just talking how there actually hasn't been a time in history that I know of where there hasn't been difficulty, and it's in the difficulty of plagues that have come, of war that goes on, that the church rises. It's, it's a time for a church to shine. I'm not saying that we're in a place of a plague. I'm just saying it's a time for the church to actually give incredible care for each other. And we're going to need more than just a pastor or more than just a couple of people or your cell leaders. The body will really have to be working together. So, I look forward to hearing your testimonies. If there's something that you want to encourage the body with and you think it's appropriate, you can send it to us, info at your anchor point, and we'd love to be able to connect in and hear the things that God is doing. So I think those are sort of my announcements for today. I want to start off, I want us to pray, but I think what I'd like to encourage is I want you to take some time, and if you can put on a couple worship songs, again, on that playlist, or you, you have a few of your own, actually just put some worship on or grab a guitar or someone plays piano or sing a cappella or pull up some lyrics. You can find lyrics all over, pull them up somewhere and just spend some time together. Pray, listen. If you don't want to sing, that's fine. Be thankful. Pause and thank him for what's going on. Begin to pray for your communities. All of us have people in our lives that are older, infants, 
and uh, people that are susceptible, that are sick, people who work in hospitals. Anchor Point's got a ton of people in hospitals that are working there, and so far I think we're doing pretty good in Manitoba. Um, there's not a lot of cases, but like around the world, there's interesting things going on. And on uh, on YouTube, there was something that was going around in Italy, where they have like a thousand deaths in the last three weeks. I think something like that. And uh, we see people out on the balconies of apartment buildings dancing and playing music and singing to each other off their balconies. And this is a time that we get to rejoice and a time when people are feeling fear, but you get to bring them and say, actually, there's a living God. There's one who wants to be with you and help you and love you and come. You can be in our midst. We're going to help care for you. Imagine communities coming together. Amazing. So right now, if you want to stop, if you want to go and put some worship on and just spend some time in Thanksgiving or worship, why don't you do that? Settle yourselves down. Wait on the Lord, get quiet before Him, but actually take the time. Let me pray for you, oh God. We're going to be gathering hundreds of people on this day, just from Anchor Point alone, are going to gather and they're going to seek you and wait upon you. And God, it's different for most people what we're doing here. It's different. God, many have not um, done this before where they're praying with their families. And God, there's so much need and there's such a, a pressing uh, on our hearts, God, to spend time with you. I pray, God, that our church would not waste away or settle down. God, I pray we wouldn't binge um, on just media. God, would we rise? We have this opportunity now, God, in these, in these weeks ahead to love our neighbors and care for our cell groups, give extraordinary care. God, I pray that you would be with us in our, in our living rooms. God, in our workplaces, the places that we're going to be, that we're watching this right now, oh God, I pray that we would know your Holy Spirit's presence. God, I keep thinking about the stories that have inspired us over the years. The stories like a George Mueller, where he has an orphanage and he knows he needs to be there waiting uh, or not having any food and praying. And then God, you just provided supernaturally. And we love to hear that story. And yet God, when we're faced for the first time, many of us, just with a, a possibility of there being something out of our control, out of the ordinary. There's all sorts of responses. God, we want to be responsible and we want to be extraordinary in our love, God. Holy Spirit, we're going to need your help. Holy Spirit, even right now, would you speak? God, is there something that you want to say to the groups or the people that are meeting? Holy Spirit, you want to show them how you see things, what it is that you're doing, God. God, what do you want them to know, God, as we begin this time together for however long, God? What is it that you want to say? Just listen quietly. Does he bring a picture or verse or a thought to mind? If you need to pause, if you need to pause the video and just sit and listen for a while, do that. You have some time. God, right now I want to take authority over fear and worry. Take authority over those spirits in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I command you to leave. I command you to lose your grip. I command you to go where Jesus sends you, not to return. God, would you replace fear? Would you replace that, God, with a, a, a deep trust in you, knowing that you're sovereign, that you're in charge, that you're in control, that you love us, God? Thank you, God, that you give us free will. God, that you give us wisdom just from practice we know some of these things and yet god in that would we respond to your holy spirit thank you for teaching us about that in the last number of weeks how to walk with you 
Thank you, God. Thank you for this time. Amen. So jumping in, uh, the last couple of weekends, if you've been at church, we've had the, the people from the journey that have been sharing 26 different messages, I think the number is. And for me, it was like a Sermon on the Mount experience. So, and what I mean by Sermon on the Mount, if you, like, do you ever imagine what that's like? Jesus going up on the mountain, people are everywhere. And then all we see in the Bible is like four verses about this topic, four about this one, six about this, 10 about this, two about this. And it's like so many different topics uh, that he's dealing with in a really short period of time. And it used to frustrate me because I was like, how are the people going to really grasp the truth of it? And over the last probably year, I've been thinking, actually, it's not that they just need to grasp the truth. It's when people are hungry, they want the truth. And when Jesus just spoke like a couple of lines, I think they just got it we're like, oh, that's what it's like. And so when we were listening to these messages, man, the number of stories of people that were inspired and challenged for me brought us to tears. We were laughing. And then you, the church, went around and encouraged these people. In fact, there was lineups to go and visit the people who spoke to share how they, you had been encouraged and spurred on. I didn't know if this was actually possible in a church. The church mutually loving and caring for each other that way, where we valued not just each other, but the things that God was teaching us. And I think that was a really good precursor to what is going on right now. Because in our, in our groups, we... I don't want you just to hear the message. I want you to hear it and at the end go, what, was it, what stood out to you? What, what connected? If in the midst of this you're like, oh, there was something and you need to pause this, just pause it, grab your journal and jot it down. Maybe even start a journal today of starting at this time. This is stuff that's likely going to go down in our history books. This particular time in history is going to be spoken of in 30 years in our history books and how a society dealt with it, and how the church responded to it. So how do we respond? I think we need to write it down, write down the story. What is God teaching in this time, and what are you learning, and how are you growing? This will be passed on through the generation. Um, I don't really know how God is teaching us at Anchor Point. Um, I'm amazed. I, I didn't know if the way that we are as a church right now, I didn't think we could even get there in my entire lifetime. I didn't really have this full ideal of what it was going to look like. And I'm not saying other churches are wrong or bad. Not at all. Each called to something different from the Lord, growing and responding the way that God has it. I love it. I love that in the course of the last three days, I've been able to correspond with many pastors in the city. All of us wrestling. How do we be responsible? How do we care for the weak, those who are strong? What do we do with our congregation? Some have chosen to keep meeting and just take some precautions. Some have canceled services and they're going online. Some are asking their people, let's just wait a week and let's see what's going to happen and be home and pray. All of those things are really, really good. However, what I'm seeing at this church, and if you are not from Anchor Point and you're listening in, uh, this is the pastor who's just going to brag on his people just a little bit. This is what I've noticed. I've noticed that people are actually hungry. I wanted to quit quit preaching for years because I didn't know preaching helped anything until... These people started to get hungry in our church. And all of a sudden preaching is invigorating because people just, they hear something and they begin to apply it in their lives. And I get so inspired. People willing to risk even what we're doing here. I wrote this down before this was going on for the message. People willing to risk even thinking that maybe to meet in homes and care for each other and be extraordinary in our love for each other, that people would do it. Actually, cell leaders are calling and saying they're filled with anticipation. Not all. But many, like, what does this mean? And what's it going to do? And it's amazing. The vulnerability. A a place that isn't built upon a person. Like, now it's like, this is legit. It's not Donovan up here preaching. Um, It's not me getting to leave. We don't even get to be together. It's the church now operating. I love that. It's becoming a family. Um, I didn't know people were going to move into the community or just come from the community and walk in our doors. I didn't know if this house church idea would happen. I didn't know about mission. I didn't know about doing church simply. I thought actually my job was to keep everybody so busy that they actually uh, wouldn't have time to sin. But I was afraid that if we didn't keep the church filled with many things, people would just go sin. I'm realizing not true. When you have relationship with God, you want to know him and time is a gift. And when we fall in love with him, we want time. I love that the church is generous and 
I just love these things. I, I love that part. I don't think by any means we've nailed it, but I love what God is doing and where we are growing. God showed me a picture last week during worship. Um, just spending time, we're singing, we're worshiping God, and he began to show me. I, I've often viewed the Christian walk as a road. And it's like we're going along and some people stop and some are helping others and some are way up the road. And last weekend, God said, that's not what I'm doing. I'm actually, the road goes around and around in like a big square. And that road is actually going around a church and it's the church that is being built. What we're doing is it's not some are way up ahead and untouchable. I think we've done it like that. It's actually God is building a church we are preparing and getting the church, the bride of Christ, ready for the return of Jesus. Like the bridegroom, like Jesus himself is coming back and he's looking for a pure and spotless bride. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And he's doing this transformative work in us. And we're building the church. Some of you, your responsibility is to go up the tower in the church and pray. Some is to be in the basement and you're making food right now. Some are outside and you're... you're fixing the yard or you're inviting people to come in and some are, are leading worship and some are building over here and some are taking scripture and making, designing things that others can be inspired by who God is. Some of us are giving more time to the poor. Some are preparing the Lord's Supper and we're taking in strangers, but every single gift that is different is also necessary and needed. So today I'm going to give you just a snapshot of what I'm going to call sort of Donovan's Sermon on the Mount. And it's nothing to do with Matthew 5 to 7. It's everything to do with I want to tie up some loose ends. And I, I think it's just appropriate as we tie it up. Not knowing what the answer will be. Some of this today is, is going to be just on the fly. What I think the Lord is doing in response to all of this stuff. So here you go. Brace yourself. First is youth. Um, we have an awesome youth ministry. And I just want you to know that. Pastor Britt is rocking this thing and people are growing now what they decided to do is to take um, the the book of math or acts i mean and they're looking at how did the early church operate so sometimes they're meeting together in homes and breaking bread and sometimes they're serving the body there's different things that they're doing so they are doing each of these things and brett asked me uh, many months ago would you come to the church and teach our middle school and our high school how to write a sermon now i i love it i got to do this on wednesday night I got to go and teach them for an hour. And in that, I have to teach them how to write a sermon, get them to write a sermon, and have them preach in an hour. So these kids were all together, and they did it. Almost every one of them preached between a one and four minute sermon to each other. And I like it because we did this in the adult side at the journey. And now we have all of, or Britt hears this and sees it, and she actually wants us to be a part of the youth. Imagine if our middle school and high school... Just learn how to take things from the word, apply it in their lives, and share it with others. What is that going to look like when we get to cell groups? Because right now, sometimes it's hard to get you adults to share stuff that God is teaching you out of the word. That's hard sometimes because we've been private for so long. And yet it says in 1 Corinthians that when you gather, you share something. Everyone shares a word or a song or a hymn. I think that's remarkable. And maybe some of our middle school and high school kids are going to go and plant churches one day. So... If you have not ever sent Brit encouragement, you should do that. Brit at your anchor point, double T. You should send her a message or pray for what's going on with the youth ministry. Okay, church planting. Glad you asked. Wow, thank you. Just a text message. I'll just pretend this came in. Please, Donovan, tell us about church planting. Done, I'd love to. So the vision we have is to plant churches across Canada and across Europe. And uh, so Mark and Sarah and, and are planning to head to Iceland to work with Pastor Gunnar there, which is super cool. And they're supposed to leave on Tuesday. Um, Pastor Armand and Mark and Sarah are supposed to head out there on Tuesday. With the coronavirus, things are kind of going awry. We're not quite sure what's happening. And it's a very likely that they're going to stay here. We didn't know how this was all going to work. But I have a question. And it's not about them going to Iceland. Because we're certain that the Lord is setting that up. But who's going to get in the tower? Who's going to pray for them? Who's going to pray for the work? Who's going to commit... Mark and Sarah, for the next 10 years, 20 years, we're going to take it. There's a burning inside and you're saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to pray. I'm going to gather. I'm going to ask them, how do I pray? What's going on? Seeking the Lord on their behalf. This week I received a message from a church plant, a group of people that used to live in Winnipeg. And they're in France and they're doing a house church out there. And they're looking for mentorship. And 
They learned from someone in our church that we know that we have a call to also help church planting in Europe. And they're wondering, would we mentor or come alongside them? I don't know if we're going to do that. But actually, we need to pray, God, what is it that you're doing? And it's not like the opportunities are limited. It's like, God, what are you saying for Anchor Point? What, do you, what is the time and what does it look like? And maybe there's people that are supposed to go there at some point. Maybe someone's going to get a job transfer in the next month or three or six. And because you heard this message, you're like, I'm in. I'm going to go. I, help me. Connect us in. Or maybe you're listening. You're like, i got to pray for these ones too. We have several people working on the idea of church planting that they may be going at some point. They know and sometime in the next one to ten years they're planning a church plant. Do you know that there's a church in St. Anne right now that almost every weekend someone from Anchor Point is preaching at? I know, right? Like, how crazy is that? That we do the journey, people have a chance to preach in front of our own church family, and then there's opportunity for people to go and share just 15, 20 minute messages at this church in St. Anne. That's amazing. Like, we have people that are rising because it's not just a pastor. Everyone has a word or a hymn or a song and God is doing this work. What about Jeff from Kandu, North Dakota? We sent him out there uh, just over a year ago. And I guess the question for him is who, who's going to pray for him? He has a desire that his church family, that they're going to fall in love with God. On Thursday, we prayed and we talked about this. And Jeff called me this week. And as we were talking, like we always do on Fridays, we, we pray and talk together. Um, he said he's been desperate for people to want to know God and would they hear him and would they do that? He said prayer was answered on Thursday. Thursday evening, they were doing a hearing God seminar. It's their second hearing God. He doesn't know if anyone in his church has ever heard God speak and the second night they're going through one of the Psalms and they're listening and they're saying, God, is there something you want to say? Is there a verse that you want to bring out? And he said that I think it was almost all, like 13 out of 18 of the people all heard God speak out of the scriptures to them. Like that's Awesome. He said all of the laboring of being there and wanting to help the church, worth it in that one moment. But actually, who's going to pray? Imagine like you're lonely, like you're in a place where they, they've been doing church a long time in a community, which is awesome. The people there in Kandu are fantastic. Don't even know what anything different than what their lives, what that looks like. And now Jeff is trying to seek God and bring them on board. But who's going to pray for Jeff and Karen? Who's going to listen? Maybe... There's someone in the church that will do that. Who has the burden for that? But again, what do we assume? We assume that everyone else will do it. It's like we assume there's someone better, someone smarter, someone more gifted, someone more called. And we have things like I'm insecure, I'm not qualified, or I haven't been to Bible college, or whatever the thing is that is in there. So this is my little four-verse stanza out of Donovan's Sermon on the Mount. People often come to Anchor Point. It's like there's all these people that are passionate to so get insecure and they're like, someone else will do it. I'm not good enough. Actually, it's not the truth. Everyone thinks that way or often they do. But have you had that thought before? The answer is most people have. But is there Holy Spirit is even hinting at it? it? It's okay if you fail at it, but it's not okay if God is prompting and you're not responding. Now, this is not pressure for you to serve. I, I don't need volunteers. Jeff doesn't need it. God doesn't need you to be praying for Jeff and can do. He doesn't need it. He can just do it. But actually, he wants to, to grow your maturity, to partner together with you so your faith can grow. Imagine, maybe it's a cell group that says, we are committing. Now that we're meeting twice a week, we're committing to praying for Mark and Sarah or Jeff or church planting. Maybe you're going to adopt something because you now have time. Think about that. Now there's time. Maybe there's something. So the question, maybe there's too much on your plate. Maybe. Good. Don't do this then. Don't get involved. Seriously. Don't do it because it's going to stress you out and it's going to stress me out. Actually, it will. Um, it's, it's not ungodly to not serve in the church. So please, this is not pressure. But actually, maybe God is saying, I want to rework your schedule. In fact, I wonder if God just reworked your schedule. Church being canceled, you have to meet at home. What are you going to do about that? Run? Hide? You're going to seclude yourself, watch Netflix, not really dig in? Sports? Gone? Now what are you going to do? Now is the time. Do we rise? Do we say, God, I'm in? And the question lies is, what is your life centered around? That's my question. What is, what is my life centered around? Work, children, TV, social media, church, extracurricular? All good things. 
all good things. But do you ever ask God how he wants you to live your life? What he wants your schedule to be like. Now, there's never been a time in your history or in mine that you have a greater opportunity to rework what your schedule is. Like, you actually don't. I don't either. I read this week that monks, they chose to live a monastic life because they wanted to organize their lives around a divine center. Yeah, was it? Don't hear, go off and be alone. They wanted to order their lives around a divine center. Their lives based and focused around God. I have to be honest, I've focused my life around many different things. Um, not bad things, but many different things. And I've been on this schedule for uh, the last number of weeks where I've eliminated many pieces. I, I have a 30-minute window in which I can go on the internet for anything on all my devices. Uh, that's for research, that's for news, that's for everything. And I have a 15-minute window to now go on to watch um, sports so I can just get the highlights of the Jets games. Yes, I do love watching the Jets. That's the amount of time that it's been limited to. Why? Because I'm really distracted by a lot of things. So this was before any of this coronavirus stuff was going on. This is where God had led me so that I would have ample time, much time, because I wanted my life around him, fixed around this divine center. I find what the monastic life is like, I find it intriguing. Everything centered around God himself. So I thought, is that really biblical? Like, is this how it is? And um, Jesus in John 5, he's like, he didn't see, do anything that he didn't see his father doing. Like nothing. Like how did he do that? Waited upon him, went off into the garden alone, climbed the mountain, spent some time, not distracted. I'm telling you that John 8, 28, a few chapters later. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. I, I John 10, 37, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. I love it. Jesus went and prayed. I love it in the Old Testament. Daniel, he had this, he had this routine, right? He had this like schedule in his life. Three times a day he goes to pray. He goes into his apartment, opens the windows, gets on his knees and prays, even in the midst of the possibility that when he doesn't bow down to worship the king, He's going to be thrown in the lion's den. But he had made a commitment to the Lord and he prayed um, over and over. Nothing wavered him. I've been dropping hints about this uh, for a long while. I'm supposed to be leaving today on a three-week um, break. One week is getting caught up on everything administrative I'm behind on. And I'm uh, doing some work in my garage, doing some building a bench. The second week I'm going away in isolation for five, five days, six days. A long walk in isolation to pray and sit but not bring things to distract me, uh, to worship, to be quiet, to draw, to reflect. And then week three, I'm gonna take my family and we're gonna to go to a cabin in Lake of the Woods. And I just want to get my life based around a divine center. And the Lord is seemingly allowing us or forcing us to do it. The question is, who determines your schedule, right? Is it you? Is your life your own? Or is your money your own? Do we ever ask Jesus about it or ask the Father? When we actually give our lives to Christ, we are now in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We're a new creation. There's something that's very different. I'm convicted here too. Kendra and I, uh, we haven't prayed lots about what our family schedule is supposed to be like. It sort of just goes about and does it. We pray, but not like, God, what is, our, what is this all supposed to look like? It's my time, my own. I think sometimes we do things like this. Um, we, for, for an example, we, we've had many people live in our home. We had a couple of acres when we lived in Steinbeck. And, and some of the people, they would jump on the lawn tractor. They have 20 minutes to just go as hard as they can and cut grass. And uh, so we're part of the family. We're trying to help people understand, like, you're, you're part of the family, so you got to contribute to these things. So they would cut grass as hard and fast as they could for 20, 25 minutes. And I'd come home, and I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated because I want those lines to be straight. And it's like they did all the fun stuff where they're ripping around and cutting the long strips, but it's not nice. And then I have to get in there and weed whack and do nice around the trees. And I kind of got frustrated. And uh, here what they're thinking is that they're helping me. But they never asked me if it helped me. They just thought, oh, I'm giving Donovan 25 minutes to help him. 
And the final letter didn't help me. It actually frustrated me because I wanted my grass to be all the same length. I didn't want to come home and have to go and cut my grass to get it even. I wanted to determine when I had time. I would have preferred if they had taken one chunk of the yard that was manageable and committed to that amount. I think we sometimes do that. It's like, God, I'm giving you my time. I go to church on Sunday. He's like, what? That, you never asked me what I wanted you to do with your time. You just do it? Like, you think somehow I need you to go to church? Now, of course he wants us to gather with believers to grow and all that stuff, but have we asked him? It's like, God, I, I give you money. It's like, I even give you 10%. Like, he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Bible never tells you. I never told you to give me 10%. I said, be a joyful giver. And I asked you to be a good steward of my money. A better question is probably the flip side. I don't mean just give everything away. I just mean the flip side of this thing is, God, it's all yours. All of it is yours. How do you want me to use the money that you've entrusted to me? The Jews spent 10% of their money on giving for the priests. They spent 10% on parties, like festivals, like the different feasts. They spent 10% on that. And then they spent another 10%, but it was only twice in a seven-year gap. So the Jews were given like 23, 24% a year. Is that the standard? No, 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 no. Ask God. It's all everything. It's all his. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's, it's all his. That's, that's the end of... I don't know, chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. What are the things that matter to God? How in this time are you going to adjust your schedule, your current schedule to fit it into the way that God would have? What needs to be pulled aside and what needs to be added in? He's not going to ask you to do it like me. I have a different job. He's not going to ask you to do it like Scott or like someone else. It's actually for you. You can't even get away with it. I think we sometimes think it's like, we don't have to ask God because I'm doing at least what they're doing. They're going to church. Or I'm getting there 15 minutes earlier. I'm working in children's bed. Like, I'm, I'm awesome. And God's like, what? I want you to ask me because I want to show you because I'm trying to grow you. So I think maybe a question that we can start with it, or to know how to do this, James, like we did in our series, is just ask God. He wants to give you wisdom. In fact, I'd be willing to bet most of you, if you stop for a minute and you were honest, to say, what is it that God would want me to change in my schedule? I'm willing to bet you would know already. Like, if I asked you, what is your schedule like? And you wrote it all down. And then you said, if I said, what would Jesus' schedule be like if he had the same job you did? You would know. Like, what, what would Jesus do? Right? The bracelet? I, I just wonder. Your schedule. Maybe something that we need to add right in is the Sabbath. A, a, a 24-hour period where you do something different than the everyday. Right? Like, it's like completely different. Like, can you imagine 24 hours, no cell phone, no TV, no YouTube, no texting, no radio, no noise, not a buzz of your cell phone. You actually turn it off and leave it 24 hours. All you have for sound, not even worship music playing, silence, the Holy Spirit's voice, and people in your life. That would be unreal. Now, the Bible doesn't say you have to. It says that it's good for you. The Sabbath. Man is not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for man. It's really good. I started trying to do this. And on my first time I tried, I just about panicked. Like I left my phone and all I took was like my credit card and my license and I put it in my pocket. I was like, what am I doing? I grabbed my back pocket. Okay, I grabbed my bum so many times in the day thinking that something was going on. But actually it became really incredible. You get bored, what do you start to do? You're creative. You, you go spend time outside. You want to go for a walk. You, you hear the neighbors for the first time outside. In fact, while we're recording this, I can hear my neighbors outside today. They're having a fire outside. I'm going there because it's the evening and you're watching in the morning. I think it's actually amazing. Could you do it? Could, could we do it? I know I'm harping on this thing, but like, could you do it? And could you do it now? Would you be willing to give it a try? Would you be willing to give it a whirl and see if it changes you? Uh, maybe you'd do it with me. I, I'm kind of freaking out about it because I, I cheat sometimes on the Sabbath. I, I have my phone set where from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. I can't get anything. I put these other restrictions and I'm realizing I'm reading a whole lot more. Again, I'm going outside and just 
I just wonder if excuses would change and laziness would adjust and the kingdom of God would actually become our focus, a divine center. Can you imagine? Maybe you would join me. If you're listening to this and you're like, oh man, talk about this in your group. Talk with your family. Just see. Try for six weeks. Try like pray each evening together in the morning, but try it for a little bit of time. All right. A couple of people have asked me. I just have a, I don't know, I probably have a list of about 20 more things. So I'm just going to adjust, uh, talk to you about one or two more things. Many people have asked about having mentors in their life. Are mentors a good thing? Uh, yes, they're very good. But we sometimes get a little bit weird about this because we, we want to ask someone to meet or get time. And a lot of people ask, Donovan, would you mentor me? And I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. But I'm realizing again that, and again, I'm, I'm sorry if I brought this up. This is my, my Matthew, my Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'm not all that good of a mentor, especially the more people there are, the harder it is to mentor. Because actually mentorship, if we just sit down and have coffee once every six weeks, not really helping someone. I'm giving you some ideas perhaps and trying to lead you to the Lord and I want to meet with people. But actually what most people really need is a friend running in the same direction that you're every day, every other day, there's the, the two and you're, you're going together. And then when you're running into difficulty together, then maybe you, you come and you say, can we meet? Can we talk this through? Actually what people need when they're struggling through sin and they want accountability, you don't need me to just come and block it. You actually go to your cell group and have courage and say, cell, I need help. Cell, please. Like, this is what's going on. And it's not just to confess sin. It's we're growing to know the Lord and to love each other. I think that's really good. I think a close friend is actually more important. I think a cell group that you meet with once or twice a week, meet them at church, meet them at home, uh, meet them in your community. I think that is going to work a whole lot better. But that takes some courage, right? If you can come to me and I can tell you, oh, I struggled in these things and I'm the pastor. And so you come and confess it to me. It's good. Some of you, there's some deep things that you've walked through. Some like an abortion or you've struggled through some where you've done some really bad things that are almost illegal. And you probably need to come and just talk and for us to sort through and get healing. But actually most of it just needs to happen in your group, in a cell and say, it's not the pastor I'm looking to, it's the body of Christ. And we have a responsibility one to another. I think that would be really good. Something that Pastor Armand is con convinced he's helping me with now is he's going to help me with my schedule. And you think, how is he going to help you? Well, I've known that I'm supposed to commit a greater amount of time into the, the ministry of prayer and the word. And so he said, Donovan, I, I want to help get your schedule in order. And so this is what we're going to be doing. This is just for your information. And it starts to, tomorrow. Is... Um, Armand is going to help to, to set up meetings with me. And so if you want to have a meeting with me, it, you're going to send an email to meeting at your anchor point. And that's, Armand's going to get it. At least right now, he's going to get it. And he's going to ask some questions like, what do you want to meet about? What does this look like? How do we do it? Uh, what the schedule is going to look like? And he's going to attempt to just not let me get out of a certain set of boundaries. Now, if there's an emergency, I'll make time and anywhere for an emergency, okay? But actually, a limited amount. And he's going to help me so that I can make sure that I'm spending time in the word and prayer and seeking the Lord on where we're heading to as a church and what he's saying and how we can do that. So meeting at your anchor point. If we can't meet for a month or six weeks, he'll help set something up so you can meet with a cell leader. You can meet with another pastor in the church or something like that. And if you want to just meet with a pastor and it doesn't matter who and you just want some pastoral care, pastor at your anchor point. Fire an email. Pastor Carter's going to get it. And he'll arrange if who you need to meet with, which one of the pastors and what it looks like and help to schedule time. And it's not so you get to have the best pastor. It's someone that would be the right fit at that time. And again, we're going to continually push people to be back into a small group. It's so important, especially now. There's many of you that are listening. We have about 200 adults regularly in cell right now in 19 different cell groups, which is kind of crazy. Seeing as the church, we were barely 19 people when we started four years ago. And uh, some of you need to get in a cell. Please, info or Carter at your anchor point. You just need to jump into a cell group. He'll help. And if we need to start new ones, we just ran 35 people through the journey. That Many of them are ready to, to host or to be a part or to lead. And we will do it because there's a need right now. So if you're not in a group, can you send them a message and be like, Carter, I want in. Please, I want in. Again, there's a place to get mentorship. 
If you're starting a business, you probably want to find someone that has more experience than you and say, I got some, I got some questions. Maybe there's someone in the church that just intrigues you. Maybe don't set up mentorship, but just call them and say, would you give me 45 minutes of your time? I have some questions to ask you. Come with a notebook, everything written down and go and meet with them and just stick to the 45 minutes. Whatever you set up, stick to it and leave. And after, you don't have to meet with them again, but if there's something intriguing, something where maybe there's a few more questions to ask, ask them again. If you make it too formal, too quick, it becomes like harder to get out of, you know, then you, you lock yourselves in. But actually, maybe you just need one or two times with them. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's in the area of prophecy you want to grow or you want to grow in the area of preaching or, or there's something else that you, you, and maybe we have many people and we look at the fruit of their lives and say, I want something like that. Uh, church, I, I got to wrap this thing up. I'm in the process of wondering through a great deal of many things. Uh, there's so many topics that I'm sorting through right now. And one of the topics is a, even a conversation of prophecy, foretelling what is to come. And I've been told that I'm a prophet, and yet on the flip side, I don't think I've heard God much about the future. Mostly God gives me a picture and it helps me to understand, and I'm going to call it a, a word of understanding. Um, it says that Paul, he's praying for the church, and he says, I, I pray that, that you would give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding. I think there's something about that, but true prophecy for telling what is to come. Something I want us to grow in, because a couple weeks ago, I, I went to a church that has someone who has really trusted in prophecy and prophesied and shared a great deal of many things that were so bang on accurate, and I can foresee them coming, things that he would have never known about. I was like, this is why prophecy needs to be in the church. But I think what we've done is we've created boundaries on prophecy because we haven't followed maybe biblical boundaries of prophecy. Biblical boundaries, if you look in 1 Corinthians 14, it says when you gather and someone's going to prophesy, the other prophets test the word that was given. Like I, I went to a prophecy session once. Someone told me, you're going to lose your job and this person here is going to get your job. Think it ever happened? It didn't. But there's no other prophets testing it. The person is still prophesying today. He also said that, this person and this person, they were going to get married. One was 16, one was 17, and they were going to get married that year. It wasn't even legal without parental consent. It didn't happen. That disqualifies the prophet at that moment from being a prophet. But if we just did what the Bible said, where prophets gather together, test the words that are there, we're going to find out which people are prophets. We're going to test it and find out. And I think if you do it in your cell group, you're like, let's try to practice this thing. Let's see if God will bring something to mind and and you listen, you say, God, it says in the Bible that we're supposed to eagerly desire it. What would happen if we did? Can you imagine? God says, in a year, this is what's going to come. You're like, I don't know if that's really good. And in a year it happens, you got a prophet who's probably trusted. But we get to test it. But I think we're so individual in our society that we would never want someone to speak into our lives and say, I don't think that was from the Holy Spirit. We'd be so offended. And Paul's like, no, prophets should do this for each other. So that it's not about you, it's about the Lord, and you're testing to make sure that the word is from the Lord. Imagine that. And so, how I wrap it up. In your group, maybe with your family, maybe it's just your spouse, maybe it's just with a friend, maybe it's with your children. Let's pray. There's people who are, who are not well, they're sick. There's people that have traveled and they need to be isolated for a period of time. We need to pray. We need to pray for wisdom. Maybe God is asking you to pray for one of these people. Mark and Sarah or Iceland or, or Jeff or some of the leaders that are coming up. Maybe you're to fast. Maybe you need to listen and share. Maybe you just need to ask people to pray over you. Maybe you've never done that, but maybe you need to and say, can you pray for me, please? Maybe fear of this whole coronavirus is creeping up on you. Right now, stop. Right at the end of this and just gather and say, I'm afraid. It's okay. Don't be embarrassed about it. Pray. Be honest. Be the body. Allow people to care for you. Don't be individual. We need each other. Maybe you got nothing. Maybe you just need to start praying for your neighbors. Maybe God is saying, actually, right now, go for a walk. Whatever it is, don't leave this. Don't just sh turn it off. Do something with it. There's a response song on the app. You can turn that on. But please open up your journals. Maybe take even 10, 15 minutes right now. Just say, God, what do you have? Begin to write. What comes to mind? What is he bringing up? 
write it down, but take time and stop. We have a gift of time. You don't travel to and from church. You're not picking up kids or doing coffee. You get time. Do that. And then share with each other what God is doing and pray for each other. Church, I love you. I'm so grateful for the, the way in which God is leading us. If you have questions or things we need to talk about or address, let us know. Be the body. If you don't have a cell, please ask. We want to connect you in. Let me pray. Merciful King, gracious Father, God, for those that are listening in, that are part of our church or are not part of our church, the face of the church, at least in the next few weeks, is going to change. God, help us to gather people into our homes, to break bread, to remember you, to pray, God, will you release healing within our groups. God, the miraculous, the gift of prophecy. Again, I pray that insecurity and fear would not creep in God, but I pray when there's a nudging in our spirit, we would come to you and say, God, is this from you? God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. Thank you for silence, which allows your spirit to be so clear and strong in our minds and our hearts, God. Thank you for what you want to do in the midst of struggle, what you want to do. Thank you, having given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God, test our faith. Help us to grow in our faith. God, use us to lead us to maturity. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.